Hello, and welcome to uh, lecture number 16. Uh, we're continuing our discussion of uh, drugs of uh, use and abuse, as we say, um, particularly starting with the mostly legal drugs. We started with alcohol. Uh, now we're going to talk about caffeine, and then we'll move on to nicotine in the next lecture. So caffeine is uh, the most commonly used psychoactive drug in the world. So we're going to start off talking about a quick introduction to caffeine, talk about the pharmacokinetics of caffeine, its mechanism of action, and then spend a little bit of time talking about tolerance and dependence. So as I said, this is the most widely used psychoactive substance in the world. It's used daily by approximately 80% of the adult U.S. population. Um, caffeine was isolated from coffee in the 1820s by a German ca chemist who called it cafe base, so basically coffee base. And the word caffeine first appears in about 1823. Um, there is always continuing controversy about caffeine, whether it's healthy for you, whether it's not healthy for you, how much is, how much isn't. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, safe to say that moderate use is safe for uh, most people uh, at this point. One thing to keep in mind is uh, the amount of caffeine tends to vary uh, by uh, different types of uh, substances. So primarily caffeine is consumed uh, through drinking coffee or tea or caffeinated sodas. So here's a nice uh, look at how much caffeine uh, is in uh, different kinds of beverages. So black tea is um, a relatively modest dose of caffeine, um, almost that of brewed coffee. Uh, oolong and green tea, very low levels of coffee or sorry, loves of coffee, caffeine. Um, and keep in mind, decaffeinated coffee usually still has a little bit of caffeine. It is sort of caffeine reduced, uh, as it were. So it does have moderate amounts of caffeine depending on how much you consume. Um, chocolate bars and cocoa have some as well. Uh, espresso drinks actually don't have that much caffeine. It's about 70 milligrams per shot of espresso. So two shots of espresso is about the same as eight ounces of brewed coffee. Um, and if you're like me and drink your 20-ounce Starbucks coffee in the morning and maybe have a second 20-ounce coffee, um, we're now closer to seven, six, seven hundred milligrams of caffeine. That gets us as sort of what dosages we think about with caffeine. Uh, a low dose of caffeine is about 50 to 300 milligrams. You get increased alertness, energy, and ability to concentrate. Caffeine is definitely a cognitive um, enhancer. You are better able to focus and are more alert. Uh, caffeine also relaxes your bronchioles, increases gastric secretions, and urine output. So caffeine also ir irritates uh, the stomach a little bit uh, and also functions as a diuretic. When we get to moderate consumption, um, early a health risk. When we get to higher doses, we can get anxiety, restlessness, insomnia, and potentially tachycardia in some sensitive people. And the problem is oftentimes not knowing how much caffeine is in a particular substance. And so, um, and we'll talk about workout supplements, particularly pre-workouts. And pre-workouts tend to have very high doses of caffeine. And so, oftentimes people will have had an energy drink on top of their pre-workout, uh, and will find themselves in this sort of um, jittery, uh, high heart rate. Uh, and so, that can be particularly dangerous. And so, that's something to keep in mind something to think about with safety. Uh, in terms of the epidemiology of caffeine consumption, it kind of varies across country. It's high in, the Scandinavia, in Scandinavia versus the United States. Uh, certainly varies from type of preparation. Um, Starbucks is well known for having relatively high caffeine uh, content. Um, there's been some controversy over uh, Canadian uh, coffee chain, whose name is escaping me at the moment, uh, about what they were including in their, co in their coffee and making it perhaps a little bit more addictive. Uh, in terms of caffeine uh, uh, content of different types of coffee, uh, you have to think about what kind of coffee bean it is. So Arab Arabica beans have about half as much caffeine as Robusta beans. Oftentimes, things like flavored coffees are usually made with those Arabica beans and have lower levels of caffeine in them. Other consumption, tea, cocoa, candy bars, soft drink, the average intake of users is about 170 to 300 milligrams a day. That tends to be about what most people are consuming on a daily basis, again, depending on where you're getting your caffeine from. Um, 
So that gets us to pharmacokinetics. Uh, let's first talk about the absorption of caffeine since it's always consumed. Uh, GA absorption is about 99% within 45 minutes, so that's pretty fast. Uh, peak plasma levels uh, occur at about 120 minutes after ingestion. So keep that in mind if you're thinking about not wanting to be up too late. Uh, you've got about two hours before that cup of coffee you're drinking actually even reaches peak levels in your blood. You don't want that happening when it's time to go to bed. The half-life of caffeine is very complicated because it's very different from other drugs. It's about three and a half to five hours in adult humans. It's about 60 to 100 hours in infants, which is why nursing mothers are encouraged to not consume caffeine because it can really um, wreak havoc on an infant. And so you want to be very cautious of that. A couple other things to keep in mind about pharmacokinetics. It's reduced about, sorry, the half-life is reduced to about 30 to 50 percent in smokers. So if you're a smoker, uh, the half-life of caffeine is much shorter, so you're going to be going through much more coffee is why you often see people who are consuming, who smoke, often consuming more coffee. Um, in women on oral contraception, the half-life of caffeine is about doubled. And so you want to be very cautious of that as well. Um, and uh, hopefully none of you um, out there smoke and use oral contraceptives because that's very dangerous. Um, I mean, can lead to uh, blood clots, and a uh, number of cardiac issues. Uh, finally, the uh, half-life is prolonged during the last trimester of pregnancy. There is um, some evidence that it's best to abstain from caffeine during pregnancy, um, so that's something to keep in mind. Uh, the half-life also increases as we get older. And uh, what's happening there is as we age, it takes longer and longer for us to digest out caffeine. And you may find when you get into your 30s and 40s uh, that you can't drink coffee as late in the day as you used to uh, without it keeping you up at night. And that's something to keep in mind. It's certainly something I noticed. And so uh, older adults in particular probably shouldn't consume caffeine after late morning. Uh, otherwise, they'll be uh, awake quite a bit of the night. So caffeine gets metabolized into three different end, end products. It's metabolized by the cytochrome P1A2 subgroup of hepatic enzymes. Two major metabolites are uh, theophylline and paraxanthine. Uh, these behave similarly to caffeine, so they have sort of an additional uh, longer effect of caffeine. Uh, the third metabolite, uh, theobromine, does not. Some uh, SSRI type antidepressants inhibit this enzyme, uh, fluvoxamine, for example, is one and others uh, do not. So keep that in mind, uh, that your caffeine metabolism might be affected by other drugs that you're taking, uh, and uh, be mindful of that. So it's one of the things uh, we talk a lot about in terms of uh, people who are having trouble sleeping. We really wanna be mindful of uh, caffeine intake because uh, different types, different times in your life, caffeine may have different effects. And so it's just something to keep in mind. Finally, there are different uh, gene varieties that control caffeine metabolic enzymes. There are rapid caffeine metabolizers. These uh, folks break down caffeine at about four times the rate of uh, other people. You have to inherit this variant from both parents. Uh, the adverse side effects of caffeine are reduced because it's metabolized so quickly. Slow caffeine metabolizers, uh, these folks get this variant from at least one parent. Uh, this longer caffeine exposure does increase heart attack and hypertension risks. So you really have to just be thoughtful about how caffeine is affecting you uh, and pay attention to it. And there are plenty of people who don't like caffeine, and my guess is a lot of these people are slow caffeine metabolizers because it, because it affects them very differently. And so uh, when we talk about the risks of things like caffeine, of uh, alcohol use, of different types of drug use, oftentimes we have to be mindful of the fact that you know, People's genetics are different, and so uh, we need to keep that in mind. So, in terms of the mechanism of action for caffeine, so the mechanism of action of caffeine uh, is. Uh, 
related to the neurotransmitter adenosine. And adenosine um, antagonize, or sorry, caffeine antagonizes two types of adenosine receptors, uh, A1 and A2A. In mice that do not have the A2A receptors, caffeine only acts as a depressant, not a stimulant. Um, and so, essentially, caffeine is reducing the inhibitory effect, uh, effects of adenosine. So it, incre it acts as a stimulant by reducing that type of inhibition. So some positive effects of caffeine appear to be due to the antagonism of these adenosine receptors. These normally act on GABA neurons that inhibit dopamine release, so we get a little bit of dopamine and reductions in uh, GABA. So we're reducing inhibitory effects and increasing the excitatory effects of dopamine. So that removal of that GABAergic inhibition increases that dopamine release. So part of the um, effects of caffeine have to do with an increase in the amount of dopamine available. So this is one of those biological processes that um, is um, a little bit backwards. So caffeine doesn't directly affect your uh, behavior. It affects it by inhibiting an inhibitory neurotransmitter. And so when you inhibit inhibition, you end up with excitation. It's sort of like, you know, two minuses make a plus, right? Um, so keep in mind, oftentimes, the mechanism of action of different types of drugs do require this kind of thinking about if we inhibit this, that means that becomes excitatory. So we end up with these increases in dopamine. So in terms of the uh, overall effects of caffeine, there are a lot of different uh, benefits uh, to uh, consuming caffeine, reduced inflammation, reduced risk of stroke, we get improved glucose metabolism and re reduced risk for diabetes, reductions in cancer risk. Um, caffeine also improves headache relief. In fact, some headache medicines like Excedrin include a pretty healthy dose of caffeine. Um, we get decreased risk of some diseases, increases in arousal, improved physical endurance and concentration, reduced fatigue. Um, acts as a diuretic and also relaxes our bronchi. So all of these potentially are positive effects. Some adverse effects usually occurs at levels of heavy consumption. So if you are consuming 12 or more cups per day or at about one and a half grams of caffeine, so 1500 grams of caffeine, you can get agitation, anxiety, tremors, rapid breathing, insomnia. Uh, the LD or lethal dose is estimated at about 10 grams taken orally. So this is pretty difficult to do, drinking coffee. It's hard to get 100 cups of coffee down you in a day. Uh, death is usually due to convulsions and respiratory collapse. There have been about six deaths in humans. There have been um, a number of cases recently in the news because you can actually buy powdered caffeine uh, online, and it's something that you should not, not do. Um, I mean, you should not do it uh, because it is really risky because you can certainly end up consuming far more caffeine than you might have otherwise. So that's this caffeine powder warning. These product warning, these products are, are essentially 100% caffeine. A single teaspoon of pure caffeine is 28 cups of coffee. And so that is something you should not be using. That's one of the problems, and we'll talk about this here in a little bit, with uh, a lot of pre-workouts because they contain caffeine powder. And so you want to be very, very cautious with uh, So we get then to what we call caffeinism. At doses above 1,000 milligrams a day, you can get serious effects, delirium, excitement, uh, ringing in your ears, flashes of light, a low-grade fever, flush, insomnia, regular heartbeat, loss of appetite. I mean, this is like, you know, we're at the levels of cocaine and amphetamines, which are coming up in a couple of lectures. So this tends to look a little bit like an anxiety disorder, but treatment with tranquilizers does not help because they're not affecting the same neurotransmitter systems. The only treatment is to eliminate the caffeine and wait for it to uh, process out. Not much else to be done about it apart from that. So I think it's important to think about caffeines and pre-workouts. If you look at this Caffeine Informer uh, website, it will show you the caffeine levels and workout supplements, and they can be really high. And so just be mindful of that, uh, what you're consuming along with those pre-workouts. Uh, and if you're somebody who has uh, already has high blood pressure or already has a high heart rate, you want to be very cautious with those. The most concerning adverse effects of caffeine are its effect on sleep. So it may impair the duration of quality of sleep and cause repeated awakenings. 
Um, we talked a little bit about this in a previous lecture about the combined use of energy drinks and alcohol. We uh, really can be associated with risky behavior. Uh, those energy drinks make you feel more alert, but you also still have the intoxicating effects of alcohol without the subjective feelings of intoxication. Uh, in particular, it increases sexually risky behaviors. So people are more likely to engage in uh, unsafer sex, risky types of sex. Also increases the amount of fighting. It's also been shown to be associated with prescription drug abuse, alcohol abuse, and cigarette smoking. All of these things seem to go along with uh, combining alcohol and uh, those energy drinks. So keep that in mind. In terms of caffeine tolerance and dependence, the uh, DSM-5 includes um, a criteria for four caffeine-related disorders, caffeine intoxication, caffeine withdrawal, other caffeine-induced disorders and unspecif unspecified caffeine-related disorders. Um, a number of you have probably have gone through uh, caffeine withdrawal. Most often for most of us, it's a headache, um, and a little caffeine will resolve that. Also, maybe lethargic, not able to pay attention, etc. So, uh, individuals often become dependent. I'm, I mean, certainly I'm dependent on caffeine. I'm sure, many of you are. Uh, the median daily intake includes about 360 milligram. Um, about 40% took less than 300 milligrams for those who become dependent. Uh, the withdrawal symptoms include generally a headache, uh, tiredness, uh, anxiety, irritability, depression. I don't think I've ever gotten nauseous or vomited because of my caffeine withdrawal. Um, this can, tends to begin 12 to 24 hours and will peak by 20 to 48 hours. So once you get through a couple of days, if you're trying to just completely quit caffeine, give it a couple days and you'll be fine. And again, this is not generally related to the quantity of caffeine used uh, because everyone's a little bit different. And so people are already usually drinking the amount of caffeine they can tolerate and that depends on their metabolism and et cetera. So uh, keep that in mind if you're trying to quit caffeine, it'll be over in a couple days. You may still miss the caffeine, uh, but, you know, at least you won't feel as terrible during, as you are during that withdrawal period. So some effects of caffeine do become tolerant. Um, it will no longer increase your blood pressure or heart rate if you become tolerant. Um, it doesn't affect our adrenaline or noradrenaline levels as much. We don't get anxious or have as much nervousness or energy. Um, we don't become tolerant to the alertness and wakefulness, which is good because that's usually what we're all looking for is that alertness and wakefulness. Um, our cerebral energy metabolism is still unaffected. Uh, that is, we don't become tolerant to that. That's one of the sort of benefits of caffeine is that energy metabolism. So in general, we can become tolerant to the negative effects. That is, we no longer have those negative effects, but some of the positive effects um, don't show any sort of tolerance. Um, in terms of caffeine as a reinforcer or reward, uh, we can discriminate caffeine from placebo in coffee or capsules at about 300 milligrams. Uh, that's sort of what we would call the detection threshold. Uh, some people can detect much lower doses, just depends on their sensitivity. Caffeine is not a powerful reinforcer in animals self-administering intravenously, so it's not like other stimulants, caffeine, or sorry, cocaine, amphetamines, which uh, animals do self-administer intravenously. And so it's not particularly reinforcing. Most of us just like uh, caffeine. And also because the effects are a little bit displaced from its um, ingestion. So it's two hours later that you're reaching that peak plasma concentration. And that's so far removed from the behavior itself that uh, rewarding effects So, and reinforcement can vary with dose. That is, intake is strongly related to avoiding withdrawal. So remember, back to the principles we talked about uh, a number of times in terms of reinforcement, that negative reinforcement is the avoidance of or removal of negative things. So getting, uh, avoiding that withdrawal is uh, an important part of that. We do get a release of dopamine in the brain, but it's not in that pleasure center. It's not in the nucleus accumbens. Um, it's more associated with movement and places in the frontal cortex, which are associated with attention and concentration. And so that's the reason why uh, caffeine provides us energy to move and also allows us to concentrate and uh, fix our attention uh, to a greater extent.
All right, well, that's our introduction to caffeine, uh, our most commonly used drug in the world. Uh, next, we're going to talk about uh, nicotine, which is also very commonly used and one of the um, most uh, deadly in terms of its uh, effects on